used to dwell in a house among his people But now he has a home that's better than the first It doesn't look like a building with a steeple Now he's living in the people of the church Brick after brick, God is building his temple Brick after brick, he is making it strong With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones He is building a place he can live about something um, this week. We've often had uh, Joshua mentioned in the Bible. It always refers to him as Joshua, son of Nun. So this guy Nun, we don't really know anything about him, any information about him, basically, um, except where he fits in the family tree. That's about it. But I, I was thinking about him, and what must it have been like for him to watch his son's career, so to speak? Joshua was quite a character, taken over from Moses and everything. He had, he had uh, a big assignment, and he certainly did it well. So whenever none heard about what Joshua might have been doing at one time or another, he can't help but think he must have been saying, that's my boy. That's every, every son's dream, right? For his dad to say, that's my boy. That's what we look for from our Father in Heaven, that one day he's going to say, that's my boy, that's my girl. And you, you might tend to think, well, what kind of marvelous things can I accomplish that's going to elicit that kind of reaction from God? I mean, with all the people that have gone before me and all the things they've done. But he's not looking for you to be famous. He's not looking for you to necessarily be doing things that are going to be written down and celebrated for years to come. He wants to know that you did everything you can to live for him and you never gave up. So that one day he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. You never gave up. You kept trying. You kept living for me as best as you could. Now your job's done. Come on home. That's how to make your father proud. Today we're going to Luke. We're going to be calling this Let Down Your Nets. This is, I think, an essential skill for believers. You'll see what I mean as we go. So going to the text, Luke 5. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him, that is Jesus, to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, another way of saying the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. First thing that caught my eye here is right at the beginning. On this particular day, the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God. Oh, that we could see more of that today, that people can't get enough of the word of God. It makes me think back to these times, like back in the 1800s, we had these Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening, these big movements for God. And wouldn't it be something to see something like that today? One of the things Jesus noticed was that the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Why is this important? It means they're done. They've been out all night fishing, and that was the ideal time to go. So they went, they're back, they're washing their nets now, because if you just take the nets out of the water and throw them down, they're going to get rotted and they're going to fall apart. So you got to rinse them out, dry them in the sun. So that's a few extra steps on its own. So they're done for the day. They don't plan on going doing any fishing until that evening or that night. So Jesus said, let's go out a little bit from the land here, just go a little bit out in the water. He sat down and taught the people from the boat. The teacher sitting down would be typical then. These days, even in school, we tend to have a, the reverse of that, right? You know, the teacher usually stands up and the students sit down. Much like you lazy, I mean fine people uh, here today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just had to... Uh, no, it's just, a, it's just a different way to do it. So that was kind of his pulpit. The other reason he wanted to go out a little bit from the land is that is a little bit of a bowl-shaped area where they were, and it's an acoustic thing, too. Your voice carries better over water. 
Now, Jesus could certainly make himself heard, you know, any way, no matter where he is, just because he wanted to. But I think this is one of those little details that shows how, how complete a human experience he had. He just used his human voice and knew how to take advantage of it, like the rest of us would. So getting to our key here. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. Put down into the deep and let down your nets. We just did that. We did that all night. We put the nets away. We're done. Why are we doing this? A number of good reasons for thinking that way. It was day rather than evening or night, which was a better time to fish. They just got back. They're done. They're tired. The nets are already clean. He's a professional fisherman. He does this for a living. He ought to know the best way to fish. He's like, I don't get it. Why are you doing this to me? So it doesn't say too much, but he does say this. He says, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I'll let down the nets. If you say so, we'll do it. I just want to quickly point out here two Greek words, epistatis versus diaskalos. This word here, master, is actually only used in Luke. And it's a little more generic, so to speak. It's like, okay, boss, as opposed to in the other Gospels where they'd use didaskalos, which means the teacher is more of their intimate personal relationship with, with Jesus. The only reason for this really is because Gentiles reading this would relate to the first word better. He wasn't being a wise guy. He wasn't indicating any change in their relationship. This is just the word that's used because it'll be more understandable. So they went back out gathered up the nets, got in the boat, and went back out there and dropped the nets. And when they had done this, they got the surprise of a lifetime as they enclosed so many fish, the nets couldn't hardly hold them. It's starting to break. So kudos to Simon here for choosing to obey Jesus in spite of his natural instincts and experience. This willingness led to a miracle. In fact, they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats And the boats were starting to sink. There were so many fish. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. So many fish that they could fill up both boats and they were starting to sink. Why this many? To make sure everybody understood that this was miraculous. It wasn't just good luck. This doesn't happen on a routine fishing trip. So why, by the way, does Simon say, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord? What was the problem? Jesus said, let's get the boat, let's get the nets, get out there and get some fish. Well, he did. He wasn't entirely excited about it, but he did what he said. So what's the sinful man part? As you probably figured, It's having a rather grudgingly obedient attitude, which means a weakness of faith. He didn't really fully want to take Jesus' word for it. All right, I'll do it, but... And more so, just coming, if you think back to Isaiah, how he said, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips, realizing his unworthy status to even be in Jesus' presence. It's kind of pointed out how amazing Jesus really was doing this right in front of them. He's like, I don't even deserve to be standing here. So think about what it must have been like to be Simon Peter in that moment. This mixture of amazement to the point of fear and remorse. He was sorry for how he had behaved. He was sorry that his heart really wasn't in it when he did what Jesus said. That must have been a difficult moment for him. All the way down to verse 9 here. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. No mistake in a miracle. So also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, who got to be part of the miracle. And Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Don't be afraid. How many times has Jesus got to start something? Even all through the Old Testament, you see it. Don't freak out. Don't get excited. It's going to be okay. Here's what we're going to do. You always... You see it that way, right? Why? 
Because we're always like this over every little thing when we don't need to be. So it was simple enough for them. When they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. It's like, sounds good to us. After what we've just seen, we're on board. Sign us up. Nets catch fish, which then die. But Christ's net catches people who then live. Here's another experience that kind of comes a bit later, actually. He's talking to Simon where there was a, an issue about the temple tax. He says, what do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said from others, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, the Jewish leadership at the time, go to the sea, cast a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Our own payment. This, maybe it's because it's only one fish. This doesn't seem to get as much play as some of the other miracles because this seems a little quieter and simpler. It's not hundreds of fish. It's one fish. But it's equally amazing. How many fish are floating around out there at any given moment, wherever they might happen to be? He says, just go down there, throw your hook in. The first fish you see, first first one you get, that's going to be the one. And it's going to have a coin in its mouth. How would Jesus know that unless he orchestrated it? That's equally amazing to the one we just talked about with the hundreds of fish. I love these miracles. It's just fantastic. So it's my favorite thing in the Bible. But that's not all. Or as they say on the infomercials, but wait, there's more. John 21. He does it again. After this, Jesus revealed himself to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias again, Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. I don't like to make too much out of that. Some people will say, well, Peter just kind of gave up and decided to go fishing. Well, it was his job. That's where his money came from. So I'm, I'm not shocked that he went fishing. So I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. <laughs> they went out, fished all night, got nothing again. And then something interesting happens. Just as day was breaking, they're getting ready to wrap up. They're probably chilly, they're tired, they've had enough of trying to fish, because as you know, it's called fishing, not catching. Jesus was standing on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know it was him. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. He did it again. A couple of interesting things. Jesus stood on the shore, but they didn't know it was him. Yet, this guy says, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they did it. They have no idea who this is, but they're letting him tell them how to fish. There's a few suggestions as to why they did this. Number one is, at this point, we're desperate. We'll try anything. Another theory is, could it be that this guy knows something we don't? Maybe he's some kind of expert. Maybe he's looking out there and he sees a little ripple in the water or something we don't see. Might be worth a try. I, however, prefer another theory, which I can't prove, but... I think this is why. Because Jesus said so. Just because they didn't know it was him didn't mean they wouldn't have to obey him if it was the time. There's things that go on in the world every day at the command of Jesus, and even people don't realize it's his command. If something needs to happen, it's going to happen. He's getting ready to do a miracle. So just throw your net over there, because I said so. That's what I'm thinking, but hey. Because once again, not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Here's the first thing that got my attention. Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore. Full of large fish, 153. By himself? He must have been a strong guy. 
How did he get those fish in by himself? Some folks will say, well, that's just speaking about his leadership role. He went and they, they just kind of went with him. But honestly, I like a plain reading of scripture whenever you, we can have it. What it says is, and I think it's for a reason, it says that he went aboard and hauled the net ashore. It says he did it. Would it be a big deal for Jesus to give him the strength to do that? There's some serious encouragement right there, right? Don't we look to Jesus to get the strength to do a lot of things that we couldn't do on our own? So that wouldn't surprise me a bit. I believe that's what happened. I believe he did it himself. Though there were so many, the net was not torn. I'm not even going to try, but there's a lot of speculation about this particular line having to do with why it didn't tear when it tore the first time, the association with Jesus, which why that would be different this time as opposed to the other time, I'm not sure, having to do with the preserving uh, the catch of souls, so to speak. It's not really clear to me. I'm honestly not sure. There are a few different ways people will look at it. I'll tell you in a, in a moment why I don't think that's a big deal anyway. And Jesus said to them, the 12, back in Mark now, we're going to talk about how they ended up there in the first place on the shore. Jesus said to them, you'll all fall away for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I'll go before you to Galilee. And in Matthew, we see at the empty tomb, he, Jesus, is not here for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. If you look at these two incidents, there's a tremendous, the more I looked for people's opinions and speculations and comments and everything else to see what people were thinking, even among the various commentators, there's so much speculation. So some similarities and differences here. Luke 5 takes place pre-resurrection, of course, but in John 21, Jesus is risen. In Luke 5, they're ashore washing their nets, but in John 21, they're still out in the boat. One thing they had in common is a lot of work, a lot of fishing, and no catching. In one, he says, lower your nets for a catch. In the other one, he says, cast your net on the right side. The first one says, there's many fish, and the nets are breaking. In John 21, it's 153 large fish, and the nets hold. There is endless speculation here. Why did he say lower your nets? And then why did he say cast your net on the right side? Well, because the right side means this. I mean, I'm like, I don't know where you're getting this from, but I don't see it. 153, there are numerous websites with all these complicated mathematical formulas as to what 153 means, and I'm not even going there. There's way too much speculation here. And when you look at something like that in the Bible, you say, well, okay, then we can have all kinds of differences about the exact meaning of some of these things, but without missing what the Bible is trying to tell me, what's the principle in the background? Because there's the lesson. The principles are exactly the same for both stories. Faith in Jesus, that he's who he said he is. He can do what he says he can do. You trust him with the results. You get the instructions and you just you go with it. You're humble enough to take his word for it and not try to think you know better. You obey because that's what you do. Jesus commands and we obey. And it's an illustration of God's power and provision. This is what you need to learn from both of those stories as far as I'm concerned. All the other stuff you can explore and you can debate. And, but the bottom line is staring you in the face right now. Let's talk about obeying God when things don't necessarily look like it makes sense on the surface. Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him, Genesis 7, 5. What had he commanded him? He said, well, in an area that you talk about rain, people would say, what? What's that? I need you to build this gigantic boat because it's going to get real wet here shortly. And you're going to get all these animals and they've all got to go in there too. And then we're going to put you in there and you'll float around for a while you know, while I, I wipe out everybody else on the earth. So what was Noah's reaction? Okay, you're God, I'm not, I'm down with that. I have no idea what's going on here, but hey, if you want me to do it, I'll do it. He worked for many, many years on that with people laughing at him the whole time. Well, look how it turned out. How about in 1 Samuel? Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. What didn't Samuel say? He didn't say, what do you want? Who the heck is this? 
What's going on? He said, speak for your servant. Here, so I'm listening. Whatever you've got to say, I'm listening. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground, made use of his prophecy. He was effective because he was obedient. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. How about Isaiah? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Ooh, ooh. Anybody remember a TV show called Welcome Back, Carter? There was a character named Horshack. He used to go, ooh, 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 when he wanted to be recognized. I was, uh, when I was in uh, St. Peter and Paul's school down in Fall River as a little kid, we had a guy like that. And we had the, uh, uh, the nuns were our, were our uh, teachers. And one day he's all excited because he's got the answer. He knows and he's going, oh, 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 oh. he's holding his arm up. He's, got to, he's going like this, star, star, star. And, and, the, and the sister looked at him and went, star. So, Talking to me? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, all right, go ahead. Well, he had, he had the right answer, fortunately. But he was so excited. I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. We talked about this guy a few weeks back. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Amos, just a regular working man, and in God's hands, he was large and in charge. Joshua, the son of Nun, here he is. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who are among those who had spied out the land, that is the promised land, tore their clothes and said to all the congregation of the frightened, scaredy cat people of Israel, the land which we pass through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred for us. We're going to chew them up and spit them out because God is in control of this. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Let's pop up to a later time, Acts 20. And now, behold, I, Paul, am going to Jerusalem, constrained, or that is compelled by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. I have no doubt at all that I'm in for a bad time as I go here and there and everywhere. But I'm going to keep doing that as long as the Holy Spirit keeps talking to me, telling me what I need to know, keeping me going, empowering me to do what I need to do. I don't know what's coming And I don't care. I'm down with it because this is where God wants me to be. So if you know for sure, because sometimes we can get a little confused, we hear our own voice and we like to think it's God's, but it's not really. But if you know God's pointing you in a particular direction, then the only answer is to say yes. I'm standing here because I said yes, not just to this, but to a whole bunch of little things over a period of years that led up to it. Sometimes when you're not really sure if this is a good idea or what you're doing or how it's going to turn out or whether or not you just made a complete fool of yourself, you just say yes anyway. And you keep saying yes until things get clear and things start working out. So if God has something for you to do, he's putting you in that direction, say yes. Even if you think maybe you can't do it, say yes. Even if somebody else thinks you can't do it, say yes. Even if they say, you're not doing that here, fine, I'll do it somewhere else. But I'm saying yes, because this is what God wants me to do. That's the word. (laughs) You're on the right track already. I love it. Jabez called upon the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border, that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm or evil, so that it might not bring me pain. And God granted what he asked. He said, I want to serve. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my border. Not only do I want to serve, but let's think big. What more can I do? Because if your hand is with me, you'll keep me from harm. And I don't have to worry about it. I can just do it. A couple of years ago, we got a puppy. So this is what Elisha looked like as a puppy. His predecessor was Elijah, so I kind of had no choice, right? Uh, you can tell from the picture here, this ball is roughly as big as he is. When I rolled it right at him, did he run away saying, oh, what's this big scary thing coming right at me? No, he did just the opposite. He went after it and attacked it. 
with such enthusiasm that I think if he could have spoken, he probably would have said, is this all you got? Where's the big one? (laughs) Think big, pray big, and serve big. Don't be afraid to go for it. In Ephesians 3, it says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Far more than we can even imagine doing, we can do it. Solution is simple. Matthew 7 says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. I'm ready to go. I'm ready. How about how about now? If I keep now? What can we do to let down our nets? Two very simple things. Put away the ungodly things that are getting in your way. The things that are distracting you from a holy life. Stop doing it. Stop thinking about it. Stop reading it. Stop watching it. Stop whatever. Don't do it anymore. Gravitate toward God in every possible way in your life, in every small moment. Can I be God's servant in this moment? So once you throw your net down, what do you expect to catch? What do you think might happen? This is where sometimes we get a little nervous. We might think maybe we're going to catch something that's too much. Not right for us. If I really put myself out there, how do I know what's going to happen? Well, you don't have to worry about what's going to happen. It's always the right thing. If God gives you an assignment, it's the right one. How do I know I'll be able to do it? Because he'll enable you to do it. Because he wants you to do it. He knows you're not going to do it on your own. That's the plan. So what might keep us from letting our nets down? You don't ask for it. You're kind of happy the way things are. Maybe you're doubtful. You don't believe it'll happen. Maybe you don't really even want it because you're just too scared. There was a book written a number of years ago called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway by Dr. Susan Jeffress. And for years, I thought that was the coolest thing and something that I tried to do. Yep, this is scary, but I'm going to push ahead and just manage to get through it anyway. Then I found a better reference in another book. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Don't be afraid in the first place. If you trust me to be with you, you don't have to be scared. In Proverbs, there's a lot made to people who are, consider themselves wise or being wise and foolish, the pursuit of wisdom, that's that whole theme. In 3.25 and 26, here it says, Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. You won't step in that little loop hidden in the leaves and the next thing you know, you're halfway up a tree. The answer is simple. Take the Lord at his word. Do exactly what he says. Trust him for the results. Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he is making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can.